Ah, great. So before I get started, quick question and a show of hands, because I know you like that. Who, who here is already uh, managing an entrepreneurial venture? Okay, so more than 60% of you. Who here is considering uh, starting one? All right, so we've got another 10 to 15%. So I guess my job is particularly difficult today because I'm preaching to the converted. I'm supposed to be inspiring you, and I think you're already all uh, sufficiently inspired. Um, so, you know, just when I look out in this room, there are obviously a lot of faces here of people that inspire me every day to continue to be an entrepreneur. And as I walk through the corridors, there are some of the most entre inspirational entrepreneurs in the region. And uh, as I was thinking of how I would try to be inspirational, I thought about who are the people who actually inspired me to become an entrepreneur in the first place, as opposed to who are the people who continually now uh, continue to inspire me. And I think my uh, entrepreneurial journey uh, started actually with my grandfather, who was the first entrepreneur that I became acquainted with. And my grandfather uh, was born and raised in this little village uh, right at the north of Palestine. So if you look at that uh, piece of land jutting out into the sea way, way in the background, that's actually the south of Lebanon. And this village, I would make the argument, just like every other village in the Middle East, or perhaps even in the world 80 years ago, was a village of entrepreneurs. Practically everyone in the village was either a farmer, a merchant, a craftsman, or a fisherman. And they either worked for themselves or they worked within small family ventures. My grandfather's story wasn't very different. So he was raised in this home, um, in that village, and he came from a family of uh, farmers, or rather landowners, who farmed the land for their living. And I guess what made his story uh, somewhat different is that in 1948, under the threat of violence, he and his family had to leave that home and were never able to come back again. And so suddenly, uh, my grandfather, over there in the left with the Hattan Agal, uh, found himself a stranger in a strange land, a refugee, five kids, all under the age of nine, and he had to somehow find a way to feed them. Um, the choices, didn't look that good at the time. So the possibility of employment was non-existent for him. He neither had the education for it, um, nor was he legally able to do it as a refugee, uh, nor did he have the cultural background for it. So the choice of you know, going out and finding a job and taking orders from someone else, I don't think was even in his psyche. Uh, so he set out to do what every entrepreneur uh, looks to do. He, he tried to find a solution to his very imminent and pressing problem. And so he looked at his assets and he said, what do I know how to do? And again, a generation of landowners and people who knew how to farm the land. So he scoured the south of Lebanon, found himself a wonderful piece of fertile land that was as of yet underdeveloped, looked for its owner, and went to that owner with a proposition. And the proposition was, the proposition was, can I, for the next 10 years, irrigate this land for you, plant trees in it, invest in it, and at the end of the 10 years, pass it on to you, back fully invested. But during those 10 years, I would live off basically the proceeds. So it was very much a build, own, operate, transfer type of model, I guess 70 years uh, ahead of its time. Uh, the landowner accepted, and my grandfather was, was on his way in his, on, in his entrepreneurial journey. And so it went from being a farmer to essentially being a business owner, having to keep accounts, uh, tracking his employees. And later on in life, he, he started living a somewhat good life. And uh, he went from having those five children to at some point had him and his, uh, my grandmother managed to produce over 15 children. So it was a, quite a productive uh, life. Um, and, and so there was lots of valuable lessons from this. I think the first, and it's valuable for everyone in this room, is that Entrepreneurship is not something new to our region. It's not a new word. It's not a, something hot and happening right now. It's in our blood. And I'm willing to bet that practically all of us, if we look back in our histories, we will find that our grandfathers and our great-grandfathers were entrepreneurs. So this is not, not something new. Entrepreneurship is also synonymous with freedom and choice. Here was a refugee who had, it seemed, very little freedom of choice, or of choice but entrepreneurship offered him that. And that's valuable, I think, for all of us as entrepreneurs. I think it's why a lot of us pursue this route in our lives. And it taught me a lot about resourcefulness. So we hear a lot about people saying, oh, I don't get the right resources. But he was someone who basically had no resources to speak of. 
and was able to build something out of that. And my, my family never went a hungry day in their lives. And that's because someone was able to wake up in the morning and not complain about what situation they were in, but really look at what solutions are out there that I can avail of. So the continuation of the story uh, comes down to my father. My father is the scrawny, uh, bold kid on the right-hand side. He's, he's no longer bold. I think that was uh, the haircut at the time. But here he is as a nine-year-old uh, refugee. And obviously, the pressures in my father's life were very different than the pressures in my grandfather's life. Um, from the moment they had to relocate, the big focus in uh, my grandparents' family uh, objectives was how do they get their eldest son, my father, educated? Because education would basically minimize risk. And so at age 12, my father was sent off to school um, where he, on his own to the big city, Beirut, where he was a boarder. And he was given the mandate to come out top in his class. Um, So. so what's inspirational about this is, you know, he went on, got his degree, and did what he had to do. And in this case, what he had to do was find employment. And what was interesting was big companies were just showing up in the Middle East. So what was great is he was able to take on that responsibility and minimize that risk. Um, my father, from the point of graduation, had to take care of his siblings, of which there were 15, had to take care of his parents. So it was actually a, a wonderful journey, but I think what made it most interesting was you would see about 100 images of those of my father looking out into the horizon thinking, how do I get to where I want to go? How do I become the entrepreneur? And the beauty is, in spite of all of these responsibilities, he managed to take away every penny he made and went on and built a very successful um, business and put us all through uh, great universities of which we're very proud. And so I think, you know, <laughs> the story here is entrepreneurship is, is not always about the fast buck. It's not about racing out there and making a million dollars overnight. Oftentimes it's about hard work, resilience. It's about fighting the odds. It's about really believing in something. It's also, and I think this is a lesson in life that I've never heard my grandfather or my father lament the difficulty of their situation. In fact, they always wore it as badges of courage. It was all about the wonderful experiences they had and all of the challenges they had to take on. And so what I learned is success needs no excuses. I continually hear in this region about, oh, if the government did this for me or the government did that for me. And I tell you all, the government doesn't need to give you anything. Your success is about you. All of our success is about us. And if we go out there, and we put in our effort and our hard work, we will get the results that we want. And I think this was a, a very eye-opening uh, lesson for me. So off I went to university with those sort of role models in my life. And obviously, I started hearing about these wonderful, almost mythical stories. Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all of whom dropped out of universities, went off to build these massive empires, and became immensely successful. Um, you know, while they were great stories, to me, I couldn't really connect. They were almost mythical. They were out there. We heard about them, but what did it really mean to Rabbi Ataya? Until a friend of mine, my closest friend at university, Steve Ramirez, who is one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever met, um, senior year, in spite of getting tons of offers from the best corporates in America, um, goes off and joins this company called Trilogy Software that I had never heard about. It turns out that not only Trilogy, but half my engineering class, all of the smartest folks, all went to that same software company. So I was obviously curious, what is this company? Turns out, Trilogy was started by a person with us at university. So there was a gentleman called Joe Lamont, who junior year, in spite of coming from a very privileged background, having done very well academically, decided he had had enough of school. He no longer needed to be in university. Seemingly crazy at the time. Why would someone decide, you know, they're top of their game that they wouldn't want to be there anymore? Um, convinced a few of his friends to do the same. They picked up a phone, 
and started calling up the Fortune 500 companies in the US and saying, hi, we're a bunch of Stanford students, we're doing a research project, and we're wondering what type of software do you guys need? One of the calls they made was to Boeing, and they called up the Boeing, the head of technology in Boeing, and said, what do you guys need? And Boeing said, well, listen, one of the most complex things we have to do is configure planes as we're selling them. So there are so many different parts and so many different ways to build a plane, and they all affect the cost of the plane and the delivery time. So we would love a sales configurator. And so Joe, legend says, asked how much are you willing to pay for something like that? And supposedly the response was north of $100 million. And so Joe shut the phone, a couple of months later, project was delivered, $100 million in top line, over $90 million in profit. And so this was a, you know, an unbelievable story, but it taught me also a lot of very valuable lessons. Entrepreneurship is not about the great idea. You don't have to wake up one day and click your heels and say, I found it, Eureka. It's about listening. It's about listening to where is the pain and what service can I offer to actually help people out. It's also about great execution. What made Joe extra special was he was able to very, very quickly build this product that Fortune 500 companies thought was seemingly impossible to build. And he did it with the best people around. So for a startup to be able to hire Stanford's top engineers in one year without having gone public or without having made a ton of money was just almost an impossible feat, but he realized to have great success, uh, you needed great people. And then Joe's story is also about risk, and entrepreneurship is always about risk. He took the risk of dropping out, he took the risk of starting this new venture, and interestingly enough, he wanted to ingrain this culture of risk across his organization. So I remember Steve would always tell me once a year, Joe would take the entire staff of the company off to Las Vegas to gamble, so that they learned about the value of risk. And I think that's something we should all learn also as we're looking out at, the, at, at our entrepreneurship um, stories. So when Steve went off to, um, to Trilogy, I decided that I wanted to pursue a, a short career in investment banking. And my logic was I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, um, but I wasn't quite sure how to tackle it. So I thought investment banking would be a great opportunity to see wonderful entrepreneurs who are successful either going public or buying and selling other companies. And the very first deal I worked on was actually this company called Remedy. And Remedy, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but Mejdi, are you here? So Mejdi knows Remedy very well because he, he managed to make quite a bit of money on it as opposed to me. <laughs> um, Remedy became the hottest IPO uh, of that year and continued to grow and become a really impressive company because before it was finally bought out. But Larry Garlick, who was the CEO and the founder, had a very interesting story. And, and I got to learn this story just hanging out with him. And his story was he graduated from university, joined Hewlett Packard as an engineer, and for the next several decades was a dutiful, loyal employee of this large multinational company and was extremely happy. And it seemed he did not have an entrepreneurial bone in his body had no desire, had no inclination, never really looked at it. And one day, his boss comes to him and says, Larry, we're moving your division from California to Washington State. So being the dutiful, loyal employee, uh, Larry goes back to his wife and says, we're moving. To which his wife says, not over my dead body. So he looks at her and, what are you talking about? I raised my kids here, our friends are here, this is our house, we're staying here. If you wanna go, you can go on your own, but I'm staying here. And so Larry suddenly find, found himself, after several decades of work, out of a job. Figured, what do I do next? Started picking up the phone, asking his friends, what do you guys need? Came up with a concept for a help desk software, which became the birth of Remedy. And three years later, as we were taking him public, he was going to be worth several hundred million dollars. So here's someone who didn't even have an inkling of wanting to be an entrepreneur. And so this was also a valuable lesson. Entrepreneurship is not about age. A lot of people think they've missed the boat, but he was a person who for decades had done something, and he obviously had not missed the boat. Um, and he also taught me a lot about institution building, that you can build something for the short term, but from day one, what he did was he built this company to be able to go public, to be able to survive without him, and to give him the freedom to go on and do whatever he wanted in his life. So I think just in brief summary, uh, some of the lessons. One is to be a successful entrepreneur, age doesn't matter. You can be young, you can be old, you can be any age. Um, doesn't matter if you've got a college degree or not, 
all of the people I gave you had different profiles. And I think as you look around in this room and in this conference, you get the whole mix of, of possibilities. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your level of commitments are. It doesn't matter if you have an idea. Um, I would argue that it's in all of our DNA. So all it takes is just the desire to do it, and that we go out and we do it. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? Go ahead. Uh, this last story you were saying, um, the the guy called uh, was, he, was his name the what's his name? Sorry. Larry Garlic. Yeah, Larry Garlic. He called someone and and told them about remedy, but you never really told us how they get inspired to actually do it. You keep yeah. saying they did it, they found the place, they did sure. that. But so I, I think in all of their cases, there there was a di in in his case, he was out of a job, and he had to create something for himself and. He figured, what do I create? And the easy answer was, let me ask people what they need. And oftentimes, it's as, it's as basic as that. It's about lifting up the phone and saying, hey, you know, I've known you for years. You're working in this organization. What is it that your organization is lacking right now? And so if you get five or six of these phone calls with the same response, we need the following, that's a business idea. And that's what he realized. So he got a whole bunch of calls. He made a whole bunch of calls, which came up with the same result, and thought, well, I can do this. And that shouldn't be an issue. And he did it. And it, you know, just doing it is the, is the important summary of this. Rabia, how do you uh, how do you think about risk? I mean, you're obviously a, a successful uh, serial entrepreneur. You've done a couple of things, and and I'm sure you've had to make difficult decisions along the way, and decisions of which you weren't sure about the outcome. So, how do you think about the risk before you before you go out and make big decisions, whether it involves investment, a key hire, um, you know, letting someone go in case they're not performing even though you care about that person. I mean, it can cover any of those things. How do you think about risk? So I don't try and rationalize it too much. For me, risk, I try to do something every day that makes me feel uncomfortable, including standing up here. So a priori, is it enjoyable for me to stand up in front of a room of my peers, many of whom are far more distinguished and able to be up here than I am? That makes me fundamentally somewhat uncomfortable, but I realize that risk also has a potential of significant reward. And so when we look, we are continually thinking of ways that we can push ourselves beyond the limits of our comfort in order to try something new and exciting that has potentially great outcomes. And we don't fear the downside of it. We always ask the question, what do we have to lose? And fundamentally, most of the time, the answer to that is close to nothing. There might be some money lost. There might be you know, some time lost. But at the end of the day, you know what? Uh, I, I would rather have lost that resource than not to have tried. Uh, so we tend to be quite welcoming of risk. It is calculated. So I, I rarely put everything on the table. I'm not one of these guys who will go off and put all of the company's resources on a single bet. I try and divide because I accept the fact that we're more likely to make a mistake than a success. But we figure if we make enough mistakes, there will be a few successes. And so our job is to continually make mistakes. And, and, and we pride ourselves on that. So we're continually asked, do you fail? And the answer is always yes, yes, yes. It doesn't worry me. Hi, Rabia. Hi. Um, I just wanted to get your take on what is your management style. Um, you know, there's so many different types of people who, when they lead teams, some of them are very much into micromanaging, others delegate a lot. Um, but more specifically, for example, how do you balance the carrot versus stick? So keeping a team motivated and getting them to get the job done, basically. So I view myself as a very poor manager, honestly. I, I don't enjoy managing. I don't enjoy managing people. And the way I've, I've tackled Anything I've done to date is I try and surround myself with people I truly enjoy working with and who I have a huge amount of faith and trust in. And that allows me to really come to work every day with a smile on my face. And it's about us challenging each other as opposed to me trying to give instructions and look for outcomes. So there are a few of you know, my key 
team members here from Mona, Lama, Akram, I don't know if Danny's in the room. But I, you know, when I come to work with them on a daily basis, it's a joy, and I can't remember once actually having to ask someone to do something. It's generally we paint a big picture. Everyone then takes a little piece of that pie and says, I can do this better than anyone else, and they go off and do it, and, and, and that's, that's joyous for me. Could I be more effective otherwise? I probably might be able to, but I, I wouldn't have as much fun in my life, and so that's a trade-off that I'm willing to, to balance. Hi. Alain Samer. Thank you. I'm not sure. I can hear you. <laughs> sure. No? Okay. Um, it, it concentrates on the successes, not the failures. So, like. <laughs> Your grandpa, basically, he asked for this piece of land, and the, uh, the owner said, yes, take it. The Larry X, he said, do you have problems? And these people say yes. So if um, the piece of land wasn't granted, and the, uh, there wasn't any problem, I'm out of the job. So, so, so I think the answer to that question is, it's very easy to pick a start point and an end point and draw a line and say, wow, look, that line is smooth. But the reality is no line in any of our lives is very, very smooth. And in hindsight, it looks great. But obviously, there were massive failures in all of their experience that is in my experience. I think the only lasting failure is the failure not to get to the end point. So no matter what happens in between, you just got to wake up every day and realize, you know what, today's a new journey. So if I look at bait, you know, we've incorporated and bankrupted entities in a country like Saudi four or five times because structures didn't work and because bad things happened to us. But in hindsight, everyone says, wow, you've been in Saudi for 10 years and you guys are doing very well, et cetera. But if they look at the number of gray hairs that that operation produced in and of itself, that's massive. Uh, so I think the failure is not continuing the journey. But as long as you're persistent and resilient, and I think those what were, were the stories of my father and my grandfather was, the, the, Validating the fact that you've got to wake up every day, no matter what the odds are, smile, and take on the odds. And I think that, that's important. And if you ever turn away because you say, oh, government said no. You know, our, our philosophy, and Akram you know, is our CTO, and he'll, he'll speak about this. He'll, we'll always have discussions like, oh, look, there's this rule that can potentially stand in our way. What should we do? And the answer is never ask for permission. Let's go ahead and do it if someone slaps us on our hand. We'll say we're sorry, we'll find another way. Uh, so you gotta keep on trucking, I feel. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a student from the American University of Beirut. I just wanted to ask you, throughout your career as an entrepreneur, have you ever been careful uh, not to express all your ideas, fearing that others will take it, or, uh, I mean... No. And are there any, are there any ways to protect like innovative ideas. No, and it's irrelevant, we find. Uh, you know, if you, if you talk a look, take a look at every un successful entrepreneurial story that I personally know, it's almost never about the idea. The ideas are a dime a dozen. Everyone has a great idea. Execution is what makes the difference. So, you know, how many successful construction companies are, in the Middle East, are there in the Middle East? You will find that the vast majority of people who have made significant wealth in the Middle East have done it through construction. Is there anything original about that? Nothing. Primarily, they do it as a result of great execution and great people. So we feel we've always been unabashedly public about everything we're doing. And because we feel, you know what, if someone can do it, if it's as easy as just the idea, then we shouldn't start. You know, our competitive advantage really has to be in the execution, not in the concept. Anyone can reverse and engineer a concept down the line. So even if you protect it for a few months, the moment you go public, overnight it can be reverse engineered. Google's strength isn't an idea, it's an execution. I, I would say anyone. I mean, look at the number of people who try and reverse engineer Facebook. I mean, in the Middle East alone, there were a whole dozen bunch of ideas. It's, yeah, I, I don't worry about idea protection. Sure. No, I would agree. Rabia. With the ex your extensive experience uh, in the industry, you, uh, especially after launching a venture fund a couple of years ago, 
where do you identify the, the gaps the, for the region? Where, where are the key areas that you think that no one is innovating or coming up with new ideas? So uh, just I'll answer that question and I'll make a clarification beforehand. We didn't launch a venture fund. We said that as a company, we are interested in incubating and assisting and potentially investing in startups. And I think that's very different. We're quite opportunistic. It's not like we went out, raised some money, and it's burning a hole in our pocket trying to get out of there. Um, wh what do we find the gap is? I think we hear of a lot of great ideas without teams, and we see a lot of teams without great ideas. And mixing both is, is important, having a great idea and a team. And, and I think the philosophy we still have, we talked about the fact that I believe everyone in the region comes from a historically entrepreneurial background. But I think the background then was much more, the mindset was merchant. It's about, can I get the right trade? What the US told me is, it's not about the trade, it's about the institution, because the institution outlives the trade. And I think that's not in our mindsets yet. Most entrepreneurs I speak to say, you know what, I'm gonna build this and in two years, I'm gonna flip it and I'm gonna be worth $50 million, and we're like, thank you very much, have a good day. We're not interested in that. We're interested in someone who's saying, you know what, I want to build a phenomenal company that 20 years down the line, 100 years down the line, will still be in existence, will still be growing, can grow independently of us as founders, and that's what we're aiming to do. And, oh, by the way, if it does go public or if it does get sold, it can still give us good returns. That mindset is not yet pervasive. And, and we always talk about the, in, in several countries we've been in, we've seen very successful entrepreneurs who've said, make hay while the sun shines. Their philosophy is take the money while you can because you don't know if you can tomorrow. And, and we feel that's a shame. It's not constructive to the region as a whole. I wanted to ask about bait. Uh, you said that execution is a uh, differentiator. Uh, is this what you, uh, is this uh, Bates success factor or uh, because there are lots of bait lookalikes and I'm sure when you did it, you didn't reinvent the wheel. So w to what do you attribute this uh, success? Okay, so I, thank you for the question. And uh, first and foremost, it's about people and team and I am most proud of our team. So when you, you come visit Bait, and hopefully you will come visit us, you will automatically, upon entering the doors of Bait, feel you are in a different kind of space. It's not your typical Middle Eastern space, and it's not your typical profile of people. And I think if you get great people in a room together, they will produce great results. I think the second thing is we are dedicated to what we do, and we're dedicated to an overall vision, and it's not a short-term one. So people keep on asking me, why haven't you sold yet? And the answer is, I have zero interest in selling. I love what I do. If there's a moment when I stop loving what I do, I'll walk out the door. Um, so being a bit long-term in your vision helps, I think, because oftentimes it's just pure resilience. You wear everyone out. Everyone thinks it's a 100-meter it's a race, and you're racing the marathon. You know, Most people can't run a marathon. We're very happy to run the marathon. We always joke, we've been doing this for 10 years. In, in internet days, we're as old as the dinosaurs. In fact, we're a bit older. I mean, we preceded Facebook. We preceded a lot of the funkiest Twitter, a, a lot of the sites. And you know, if we look at our peers everywhere in the world, a lot of them have already gone bankrupt, shut down, et cetera. And we're, we're still alive, growing, kicking, and very happy doing what we're doing. That's because it is fundamentally about people. It's the people who are dedicated to it. We so we're focused on being a, our vision, and it's hanging on our walls, is being a globally admired and respected Middle Eastern institution. So we want to be an institution. We want Rabia to be irrelevant. Most people who've interacted with bait.com, the five million or so job seekers, don't know me. And that's by design. Uh, we want to be institutional. We want to be truly pan-Middle Eastern. So as you go through the Middle East, most people believe Beit is from that place. You go to Jordan, they think it's Jordanian. Saudi, they think it's Saudi. That's also by design. And our focus is 
for us to really produce something that comes out of the Middle East that anywhere in the world people recognize and say, wow, that's a Middle Eastern success. I mean, we always make this joke that Nokia came out of Finland, a population of five million people. And it's a globally admired and respected organization. We have 300 million people in the Middle East and North Africa. We should be producing hundreds of Nokias. We're not. And, and we'd love to be one of those. We're not there yet, but that's what we strive for. That's the vision that keeps us together and keeps us going. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, concerning the teamwork, you, you, you spoke a lot about teamwork, and if the team is, uh, is solid together, it could produce well. How do you do, what do you do to keep the team together and make sure that what, when you hire an employee or recruit someone, he's going to stay with you and be with you? So my interviewing style, personally, is I tend to avoid technical interviews of any kind, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can do that because I've got a great team who can do that on my behalf. Anyone who's been in an interview with me will attest to the fact that they will usually end up in a room for about two, three hours telling me their life story from the moment they were born till today with everything in between. And for me, it's all about culture. It's about sitting across from this person saying, would I enjoy working day and night with this person for the next five, ten years. And if I don't feel that, even if I think they're the absolute best people at their job, I generally shy away from that hire. Uh, so culture is important. You need to have people who have a similar vision, who have a similar mindset and a similar desire. Otherwise, it all crumbles. Um, Unfortunately, we're okay. running out of time. Great. We can no longer take questions. But Rabia is around, so if you want to thank you, and catch him Thanks. in the corridor. <laughs>